Um, usually folks uh, start open up their Zoom right at noon, so we'll give people another minute to get uh, logged on. Um, if you meant to join Food Systems Friday webinar, um, the Human Right to Food miniseries launches today uh, with our first episode being um, about how food is racialized. So we'll give folks just one more quick minute before we launch into our formal introductions, but welcome, welcome. So minutes up, so uh, <laughs> indeed, welcome to Food Systems Fridays, and this is organized by the Sustainable Food Systems faculty at Prescott College. My name is Robin Curry, and I'm the director of the Master of Science in Sustainable Food Systems program here. And our program is an intentionally online program that seeks to support students in their efforts to build more sustainable and just food systems in their own communities. Um, you know, college towns seem to collect a disproportionate number of academic activists, but more hometowns need our students applying what they're learning in the classroom to address food um, security issues in their own um, communities. Look, there are families all over the country encountering situations where they cannot find the kinds of food that they are used to in the amounts they're used to. The spotlight is really on food supply chains and clearly many of our existing food systems are not equitably ensuring food for all, even in the best of times. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar, a food system encompasses all the stages of keeping us nourished. It's the growing, the harvesting, the packaging, processing, transporting, marketing, distributing, consuming, and hopefully not too much disposing of food. Um, at, in our program, we're avid advocates for sustainable diets, which are diets with low environmental impacts, most often with local supply chains that can play an important role in ensuring food and nutrition security. As a faculty, we are thinking about the increased vulnerability to food security that has happened as a result of the isolation measures associated with COVID-19. We recognize food as a human right and have also been thinking about how food is racialized. Now more than ever, we have important work to do to ensure safe, resilient food systems. So the big question is how do we get right? The Food Systems Fridays series is focused on policies, practices, and people like our guests today uh, who can show us and help us learn about models of sustainable food systems and communities. Um, on August 7th, so in two weeks, we'll be um, airing again. Um, and so guests who have uh, agreed to uh, participate in our mini series so far include uh, Michelle Perro, uh, who is the author of, uh, she's a physician and author of the book, What's Making Our Children Sick, talking about how Latinx communities are disproportionately affected by uh, pesticide contamination and herbicide contamination. And also we have representatives from um, uh, the partnership uh, with Native Americans who will be uh, joining us just to give you an idea. And um, our guests today, um, M M Emily Offalter and also Kimberly Greeson will be rejoining us. And so today is also a participatory because we're hoping to understand uh, what topics um, you would all like us to be talking about in the future. Uh, but for today, um, we are coming to you on a Zoom webinar platform, so we're probably all way too familiar with <laughs> Zoom and video conferencing software at this point, but just a couple things to point out. First, at the uh, you are muted and we cannot see you. So, um, you know, feel free to be liberated by, by that. Um, however, if you do have questions, um, we do have the option for you to uh, raise your hand. And so at the end of our webinar, we'll be having a little bit of a Q&A session. So that's where um, you will be given the gift of speech. <laughs> um, during the uh, webinar, I am going to be monitoring chat the entire time. So I want you to look at the bottom of your screen 
for most of you, it'll be at the bottom. And there's a, a single air bubble and it says chat. So you can go ahead and click on that. And you can see that there's a two line. And so you might want to toggle that and um, look at your options. There should be uh, the option of everyone or all attendees. So please feel free to uh, uh, click it to all panelists and attendees or everyone. And we would love for you to introduce yourself and uh, which organization that you're affiliated as you feel comfortable, um, mostly because uh, what we're hoping to do here is also build a little bit of a, a community of practice and so if you are if you have resources that you would like to share um, if you are open to people contacting you because these issues are issues that you care about please um, make that known uh, in the chat so please do go ahead and introduce yourself because it's helpful for the panelists also to know um, who uh, who the audience is as they're working to tailor for you um, the chat is also where you could put your questions in for them. I'll be keeping track of them so that uh, we're sure to have them covered by, uh, by our panelists. Um, and if you have any technical glitches, that's the place to uh, let us know also. Um, yes, yeah, so we're, we'll be monitoring those. So that's the place for you to uh, speak with us. So a couple of folks I see have uh, popped in and introduced themselves. And I thank you for that, for getting that started. And I welcome more introductions. Um, so this uh, mini series is one that I'm very much looking uh, forward to because again, this is food systems. We don't have a lot of opportunities to get it wrong. <laughs> you know, we're really looking for ideas on how to get this right and not just for the short term, but to address food insecurity and food system sustainability issues in the long term. You know, and in order to do that, we have to look at the foundations and really dig deep. So the theme here is on transforming food systems for the long-term provision of healthy food for all as a human right. So I want to familiarize us as we launch into this mini-series about the human right to food. So the United Nations recognizes and also in aspects of international law that there actually that there is a human right to adequate food. And this was um, put into uh, writing in 1999. We can lament that it was just that recently, but um, it is there. Uh, and I want us to, um, I'll put in the chat when, when I'm finished speaking here, um, the link to that uh, original document. But the, the right to adequate food is defined as such. So it realized when every man, woman, and child alone or in community with others have physical and economic access at all times to adequate food or means for its procurement. And so there's two additional points that the committee wanted everyone um, to be aware of. That the availability of food in a quantity and uh, quality sufficient to satisfy the dietary needs of individuals, uh, free from adverse substances and acceptable within a culture are important, you know, is an important aspect of adequacy. There's another really important aspect of adequacy, of adequate food, the right to adequate food. Uh, the ac accessibility of such food uh, should be in ways that are sustainable and that do not interfere with the enjoyment of other human rights. And this is why we are here today. Uh, your taking time to join us today shows us that you care <laughs> about food and the food system and care also how the food system is racialized and how that intersects with the human right to food. Um, we're here, we care, but we may not all know or all be sure about how to build accountability into their own work in food systems to ensure the human right to food and understanding how the food system is racialized. 
Uh, so for these reasons, I invited uh, Dr. Emily Offalter, who is the director of Prescott College's Sustainability Education Doctoral Program, and uh, Dr. Kimberly Greeson, uh, whose core faculty in that same doctoral uh, program in sustainability education, but also in sustainable food systems, where she teaches our food justice course. So I couldn't think of two better people to launch the Human Right to Food series. Welcome Come, and I will be pasting their full bios as, as they introduce themselves. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Robin Curry, for that fabulous introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. We want to start by just breathing. You know, we take a lot of time in Zoom, and I know that um, a lot of what we look at in, with respect to white supremacy culture is a disembodied experience of the world. So let's just start by checking in with our bodies and maybe stretching, and feel free to do that and continually check in through this, um, through this experience. And we'll try to do the same and register some of what's up here in our um, intellectual consciousness here into our bodies as well. Dr. Grayson and I are here in our own respective homes and lands. And I'm here in what has been deemed Seattle, Washington and Dr. Grayson, Kona, Hawaii, respectively. Colonization and white supremacy are into, uh, intimately acquainted. And as we work to dismantle racism, we also need to recognize how ongoing colonization reinforces racialized hierarchies, violence and trauma. So I'm going to start by acknowledging the Snoqualmie Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I carry my own settler identity and ancestry here and wish to honor the indigenous peoples of this land and resist their historic and contemporary erasure. I want to acknowledge that I'm an Asian settler who was born, raised, and lived on the unceded Kanakamali land. I live in the Ka'upulehu Ahupua'a of West Hawaii Island. And here on the right, you can see a view from Hualalai, which is a mountain on which I live on. I also want to speak to the current day struggles of the Hawaiian people and their fight to protect sacred places. I stand with the protectors of Mauna Kea. Thank you. Um, also, we believe that the personal is political here. So we would like to introduce ourselves and simultaneously this concept of positionality, which we'll get into, that really speaks to our, our social identities and experiences as politically tied to power and privilege. So um, you all have heard, but my name is Dr. Emily Affalter. I use she, they pronouns. And I'm a scholar, facilitator, educator, mama, partner, daughter, and community organizer. I act as the director of Prescott College's PhD program in sustainability education. And really in this program, and Dr. Greeson is integral to it, we look at, at education through explicit social and environmental justice lenses as they pertain to pedagogy and praxis. Um, prior to this, I worked as a senior research scientist and equity consultant at the University of Washington uh, focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice initiatives in STEM higher education. Um, just my scholarship is really rooted in culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogy and thinking about understanding and dismantling white privilege in educational spheres and beyond. So I want to own my limitations and we're doing food systems work and we really see that whiteness, white supremacy, all of that permeates every sector of our society. And so um, my, my camp is really in education, but it's, it's very relevant to your world. Um, so I explore the intersections of identity, power, and privilege as they show up in classrooms, workplaces, and systems at large. Um, all of my identities inform how I engage in this work. So I'm a settler colonial white woman from a family that had access to home ownership and higher education. I'm married to a man who you can see, Nate, in the photos, um, although I do see sexuality as fluid. And a mama to Bodhi, the five-month-old, and Skye, who's three years old. 
My, my maternal grandfather was a Jewish World War II refugee, forced to assimilate and erase these identifiers to survive. All these identities, many privileged and a few minoritized, fuel and inform the work that I do as accomplice to justice movements. Welcome everyone. It's really nice to see in the chat and the participants um, some familiar faces, uh, names. Um, my name is Kimberly Greeson. I use she and they pronouns. I'm a multiracial scholar and educator, wife and mother of two children you can see there on the beach. Uh, at Prescott College, I'm core faculty for the Sustainability Education Doctoral Program. I also teach, as Robin mentioned, food justice and uh, as well as research courses. My work looks at the biopolitical context, so looking at power structures within conservation and food systems. I have the privilege to live on Hawaii Island, where I also work locally for a nonprofit here. And we work to preserve the ecological, ecological and cultural resources of the place that we are in. I'm a daughter of an immigrant and from a family of Chinese refugees during the Mao revolution. As an educated and middle class, often white passing person of color, I acknowledge and hope to use these privileges in my platform as a professor to help dismantle oppressive systems. So in today's webinar, we will center and unpack some foundational anti-oppression concepts, including positionality, intersectionality, equity versus equality, levels of racism, white privilege, and the coloniality of power. These concepts are really important to frame the conversation regarding food systems and how the work being done to address sustainability and justice is inherently tied to white supremacy and these issues of colonialism. Our work is rooted in equity pedagogy and we believe in a learning that is engaged and community-based. So we are going to call upon you in this webinar to engage. This means we will infuse this webinar with interactive elements and ask you to participate. Um, we will let you know how and when to do that. I'll put a little link in the chat and you'll be able to add that to your browser and then I'll walk you through that. The first concept we want to talk about is intersectionality. Intersectionality is developed by contemporary black legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, among others, is a notion that our identities with respect to power and oppression are multifaceted and operate at an intersection of social categorizations, such as race, gender, socioeconomic status, and sexual orientation. And that these multiple identities can compound discrimination and oppression. We wanna acknowledge that the origins of intersectionality are developed by and focused on black women who experience multiple levels of marginalization. We use this concept to understand that there are layers upon layers to our identities that inform our positionality. So our positionality, what is that? That is how our identities are socially situated and inform how we see and make meaning in the world. We write positionality statements. These help us claim who we are and how it interplays with power, privilege, and oppression. It informs the work that we do. And this is really important as positionality statements can help ground us with a focus on just food systems. So next we're going to give you some examples of doctoral students positionality statements from our program. And as you listen to these real examples, we invite you to begin to think about your own identities. Ooh. Bear with us. <laughs> Thank you for waiting. My name is Oscar Medina. This is my positionality statement. And I put this together my first year in graduate school at Prescott College. As a re-indigenized Chicanex heterosexual cisgender male, husband, and father of three brown children, one of my core values is education. 
an education that is focused on relationships to people, the four directions and elements, land, water, air, and wind, that have taught us how to exist on this Mother Earth, the land scene. As a high school educator, I'm disrupting the settler colonial school system that deprives youth of their land-based identity, one that strengthens our relationships to our ecological well-being. As displaced indigenous Chicanx people, I feel a responsibility to strengthen an identity that allows us to walk in beauty by honoring the generations that came before us and paving the way for future generations. My name is Oscar Medina. I currently reside on the traditional lands of the Tahana, Tanyaki, and Yoemi people, today known as Tucson, Arizona. I live here with my wife and three children. We're part of a Nahua community called Calpolito Xicali. Um, my roots are in Jalisco and Zacatecas, Mexico. Um, I strive to educate um, my children and youth about the value of oral history and, and a land-based identity that acknowledges um, indigenous people, their knowledge and their way of life. I hope you enjoyed this um, positionality statement and uh, I hope that you are able to craft your own. Thank you. Thank you for your patience as we segue back. And this is the second student example. Okay, here we go. And today, and switching could save you money. Oh no. So who do you talk to when you need What's to make a We're getting back. One minute. That was the YouTube. <laughs> One second. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, technology. <laughs> Do you want me to play it, Emily? Yes, now I'm gonna share screen again. <laughs> Here we go. All right, let's try this again. Hi, I'm Emily and I'm gonna share my positionality statement with you. So I recognize that my positionality as a white, straight, cisgender woman is socially constructed and is informed by both cultural institutions and the choices made by me and for me. I was adopted at birth and raised in California. I reside in the Southwest United States on occupied Hopi and Diné land. I recognize my choice to connect to places, cultures, and ideas is only accessible because of the power and privilege my body affords me. Okay. Um, so those were individual positionality statements. And we're gonna share a collective one as well. But first, thank you so much to Emily and Oscar for generously sharing their positionalities with all of us. Here's a collective positionality statement. Um, my colleagues and I wrote this, although it's been adapted since I left and it's authentic to the new group. But at the University of Washington Center for Evaluation and Research for STEM Equity, and you can access it on the center's website as a model if you're looking to build one in a team. So um, I believe we're going to put it in the chat for you so you can access that. But I'm going to read it out loud so you can think about what a group positionality statement would look 
could look and feel like. We are a team of researchers with complex intersecting identities and experiences. Our positionalities inform and fuel our advocacy for those from systemically marginalized groups in STEM fields. Collectively, we have both privileged and marginalized social identities. We are an interdisciplinary team with backgrounds in sociology, education, women's studies, and statistics. The graduate and undergraduate research assistants on our team broaden our social identity pool even more. Ultimately, our backgrounds and social identities inform how we make sense of and share others' stories. We believe it both essential and responsible to acknowledge the impact of our positionalities um, on the work that we do while striving to share others' experiences in a way that most accurately and honestly reflects their truths. So what we're trying to say with all this positionality talk is that who you are matters in justice work and your relationships to power, privilege, and oppression will play into how you engage with food systems. So we're encouraging you to make your positionality explicit, first to you, to your own self, building awareness, and subse subsequently to your community and to those that you touch. Not touch so much in COVID, but touch. Doing so indicates your commitment to becoming aware of how you occupy and navigate spaces for equity and also helps you understand your limitations, thinking through whose voices are missing as you do the work and then acting to mitigate those gaps. So Dr. Kim Greeson is going to offer you a link in the chat to a website called Padlet. We're really excited about this. Um, we ask that you all jump into that link and we have two prompts that are really here on the slide but you'll also see them in Padlet. And we're asking you to articulate your positionality and also think about it in relationship to food systems. Um, you're welcome to do this in an anonymous way um, and use a pseudonym or just not identify yourself, or you can openly identify yourself and you'll see that we did. Um, and if, you, if Padlet's not working for you also, um, you can just jot this down. So I'm gonna go to the Padlet now. <laughs> Mm, sorry, wait, gotta get out of here. One second. And when you're in Padlet, you'll see prompts at the top, this Q1 and Q2 right there on the left that you'll, you'll answer right now. And what you do is you just click the little circle with plus and it will pop up a little kind of square like a post-it note. And you can add a title, your name or a, a, a subject or you know, a pseudonym anonymous and then you write under there about you know brief things about your positionality to help you start to think about that and when you hit return it'll post and under the second question think about how this positionality plays into your relationship to food systems we'll give you about a few minutes for that And while we are screen sharing here, um, we assume you may not be, you may be in your own screen, so um, we might not be able to visually show you everything in real time that's happening, but we'll try. And we see that some people might not be able to do this on their hotspots while accessing the webinar. So um, we understand that. And you can always put something in the chat if you can't access Padlet and we can populate it for you as well.
And we're really focusing on questions one and two right now. We're going to hop to three uh, a little later in the webinar, just FYI. We're gonna do about two more minutes of um, moving through this, so just heads up. We'll do about one more minute to write in questions one and two, and then we'll reflect together. This is great. I really like seeing all of these positionality statements. Um, I'll read a few of them just for um, to kind of touch base with the call in the people that are on the phones that can't see. So Padlet is um, a space where you can populate kind of like Google Docs, but there's a little squares so if you can visualize that. Um, question one was what is your positionality? Um, Wendy Castro Harris, she Aya, residing in occupied Tongva land, indigenous to unknown tribes from El Salvador, Central America, limited by my disconnection to indigenous roots due to erasure of our culture and vast colonization. On the continuum of unlearning anti blackness that was instilled in me as a result of assimilation, aiming to find ways to connect to my land and my ancestry to fight for my community's right for food sovereignty. That's beautiful. Anonymous, white, straight woman, able-bodied, middle-class, BS, MS, working to unpack a lot of my privilege to better do social food justice work. Mixed Eastern European heritage atheist. I love it. 
Um, and then how does your food play, your positionality play with the food? Because of my unfair advantage afforded to me as a white woman, I feel, or I have white identified woman, I feel I am able to procure healthy food within a wider range of systems easily from the money and resources to acquire the food to spaces to safely prepare it for myself. I am privileged. Unearned privilege of dietitian perspective on the food system, understanding various settings of growing food, distributing food and food service. Awareness rather than experience of working jobs involving difficult labor, such as growing and harvesting food and food service with non-living wages. I have access to immense variety of fresh, healthy food, information about food, proximity to stores, safely prepare food. Thank you all for sharing. Thanks everyone, those are beautiful. We're gonna try to, Kim, do you wanna try to share? Um, the, the screen. <laughs> I'll share the Padlet next time. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Yeah. I'm going back to our PowerPoint team. Oh, this is so slow, y'all, but you know, we just, perfectionism is also a white construct, so we can just kind of we can just kind of aim to poke holes in perfectionism as we slowly get back to our slideshow. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. Here we are. When you plant lettuce, it does not grow well. If it does not grow well, you don't blame lettuce. You look for reasons it is not doing well. It may need fertilizer or more water or less sun. You never blame lettuce. Thich Nhat Hanh. This is a reminder of the structural nature of oppression. We are socialized into systems of oppression and discrimination as well as power and privilege. This is the world that we live in. And we need to check our deficit mindsets. That means deficit meaning focused on fixing the individual rather than the system. So let's reorient and commit to understanding how our behaviors fit into the wider system. We're going to shift into sort of grounding us into these key terms and concepts for racial justice. And this really will ground us in our work for a just food system and food sovereignty and food access and, and a lot of these issues pertaining to racial justice. We will explore, explore the terms such as cycle of socialization, equity versus equality. We will understand various forms of racism, the notion of white fragility, and unpack the coloniality of power. And how do these concepts of racial justice and understand how they are fully connected to the food we eat and how we grow it, how we buy it, how we have access to it. Thank you, Kim. Great setup. So we're gonna start with this cycle of socialization. We as social scientists talk, throw the word socialization around a lot, but we know a lot of you may not be coming from social science backgrounds, so we wanna unpack it a little bit. Um, so everything that we do, we believe is conditioned and socialized. And so how we were essentially acculturated to behave and believe including what we were taught to believe about race, which is known as racialization. You can see, see, sorry, you can see how society works to reinforce our belief systems with respect to racism. And in order to change, see the purple arrow down, we have to disrupt norms, assumptions, and values that otherwise reinforce themselves to uphold white supremacy and other forms of dominance and oppression. So an example of this, um, I just wanted to share, there's cultural messaging that we all receive that says America, and we can unpack what America really is, but we could be really explicit and call it the US, is the land of dreams. And if you work hard enough that you can achieve it. 
Um, we call this the notion of the US as a meritocracy. But what the pull yourself up by your bootstraps mythology fails to recognize is that it speaks volumes to those who have relative positions of power. It does not take into account those legacies of power or conversely marginalization. So it's really important for us to interrogate and think through just different assumptions around the truths that we hold and that we were acculturated to believe and consider to whom those truths are relevant and who benefits from them and also to whom might those truths not only be inaccurate but harmful. Um, the next term we wanted to share is uh, we talk a lot about equity and this notion of equity grounds our work. Um, so this may be like equity 101. Um, many of you may know this and have seen this graphic, but we wanted to unpack it to just make sure nothing was coded here. So as you can see, and some people um, critique this particular image because it could be seen as a patriarchal game, men are playing baseball and so forth. But there's a lot of ways to think through this and this is just one flawed but decent one, in my opinion. So. The idea is that everyone deserves access to watching the game. But as you can see, the fence is, is tilted and it represents societal or institutional barriers to access. And at the same time, the ground represents structural and historical barriers to access. So if everyone who wanted to watch the game were given the same lift, which is equal, equal lifts, equality, then you can see that there is still really varied visibility to the baseball game. In fact, the person with the least privilege, both contemporary and historical, has made a hole in the fence so that they can see the game. So they're subversive and tenacious, but ultimately this is less than ideal. Um, but equitable is, is different. So it looks at the situation and then gives um, or addresses it in ways that are differential to different people in different circumstances and with different historical legacies. So if everyone were given equitable distribution of lifts, taking into account both barriers of oppression or discrimination, the fence, and the historical and structural inequities, the ground, then everyone can watch Alex Rodriguez shine. I'd have just, you know, that kind of dates me. All right, so moving forward, this is even more aspirational here, but who needs a fence anyway? Um, so justice would be really getting rid of the fence. And, we encourage you to play with this metaphor from a food systems angle to really appeal to your own communities. And so we found one with apple picking access. Um, it's a graphic that's been pre-established on the internet, um, but we thought it was flawed because the people reaching for apples had height differentials. So the tallest people had the most privileged um, and it indicates that in the visual that the lift has something to do with one's body rather than the actual systems being rigged themselves. Um, so anyway, <laughs> check out this article from Cultural Organizing website that helps you think through this um, and other images that help you unpack equity versus equality. And thank you, Kim, for sharing that in the chat. Um, the last image around equity we wanted to share is just the notion that everyone's story and everyone's experience is different and deserves a listening platform. And so any sort of boilerplate, anything that you're thinking of with respect to a boilerplate or checklist orientation to this work needs to be interrogated. Um, and there's a wonderful artist, Salome Chimuku, who um, Kim's also gonna put in the chat, that did basically interview different folks for their understandings of, it, of equity um, and illustrated them. And you can see that in the, in the link that Kim's sharing. I love that. Okay. All right, we're going to move forward and talk a little bit about racism. Um, there are a lot of different ways to frame racism, but we're going to look at this three levels of racism, which helps us understand sort of the structural nature of it that none of us can escape. So I just want to shout out to my friend Rachel DeCruz, who is the VP of Policy for the Center for Social Inclusion, which is the new Race Forward. Um, because she and I actually co-presented on this at the White Privilege Conference a few years back, and this slide came from that. Um, and the White Privilege Conference is something Kim's also going to put in the link. It's a place where you can 
really convene with people to, um, to understand and dismantle notions of white privilege and problems of white privilege. Um, and it's an activist space that convenes every spring. And we'll be in Mesa next April. Okay, but with all that, um, there's a really great website called Racial Equity Tools that can help understand this framing. Um, big picture though, individual or internalized racism lies within individuals. Um, and these can be private manifestations of racism that reside in the individual. And these can include prejudice, look like xenophobia, internalized oppression and privilege, and beliefs about race that are influenced by the dominant culture. Institutional racism really occurs within and between institutions. And it's discriminatory treatment, unfair policies, and inequitable opportunities and impacts based on race produced and perpetuated by institutions. And finally, the third level of structural racism really encompasses the entire system of white supremacy, diffused and infused in all aspects of society, including our history, culture, politics, economics, and our entire social fabric. So structural racism is the most pervasive and profound form of racism. And so much of the work that we do is actually starting to to see it, make it visible, so that we can work to understand how it exists and dismantle it. We, <laughs> the next concept um, is white fragility that we wanted to share. And sorry, there's so much talking. Hopefully we'll engage you all again soon. I mean, we will, not just hopefully, but. Um, Couple more slides before that. So this is white fragility. Um, Dr. Robin D'Angelo. I have to, um, I have to mention that Dr. D'Angelo and I both graduated from the same doctoral program and have been mentored by similar scholars of color like Dr. James Banks. <clears throat> but white, fr white fragility is a concept that helps describe why white people tend to perpetuate the systemic problem of white supremacy. So I pulled two quotes on fr white fragility and I'll read them, but the first came from Teaching Tolerance's website, um, an interview around what's my complicity, and the second came from White Fragility, her book itself. Quote, every moment that I push against the socialization that I've received into a white supremacist culture, that culture is pushing right back at me and that pressure is seductive, it's comfortable. There are social rewards for not challenging racism. White people perceive you as easier to get along with when you maintain white solidarity. Quote, white fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviors in turn function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. So on that tip, um, this is some shameless self-promotion here, um, but two years before White Fragility was published, a colleague, Doug, or Sarah Rossman and I, came up with a really similar um, theory called the white liberal chamber. <clears throat> so I, I think it's really, helpful in unpacking these ideas. Um, I'm gonna read from this. This is from the Huffington Post in 2016. I think Kim's putting it in the chat as well. Um, quote, no white person really wants to talk about how we participate in maintaining the status quo. Our silence keeps racism in place. We call this space of silence and inactivity among white progressives, the white liberal chamber. We, we noted it the WLC acronym. The WLC is a space where well-meaning, empathic white people get stuck. They may, may feel something is wrong, shame, guilt, and fear. While they may feel something is wrong, shame, guilt, and fear can be paralyzing. The WLC exists because people are afraid of failure. No one wants to look bad by saying the wrong thing or experience discomfort. We, the authors, are tenants of the WLC ourselves, so we're doing some serious self-study on this. Um, and I think the most important lesson is that from this and why we wanted to share is that no one is exempt from the socialization into a white supremacist culture. So we all need to begin by recognizing that truth. And as white people, for my speaking for myself, taking accountability for our complicity in it.
The final terms and concepts we're gonna look at is this idea of the coloniality of power as well as colonialism. Understanding colonialism and the coloniality of power is important, especially in a settler nation state such as the US, where current day indigenous people still face the political effects of colonialism. Quiano's concept of coloniality of power, it looks at the impacts of colonialism on communities currently and, and today. It is the idea that colonialism perpetuates systems of power, including systems of hierarchies, systems of knowledge and cultural systems. It is understanding that these systems and that the world that we live in in the US is largely based on Western Eurocentric perspectives. Colonialism is a process and practice of oppression, domination and theft of one's people's land, um, of peoples over another. In relation to food and the food system, colonialism is enacted through land access, um, who owns land, who has access to owning land, who are our farmers, uh, who produces our food, how they are treated, who has access to this good nourishing food. And then who determines these systems? This can be seen in food sovereignty, food access, cultural appropriation of food, and the social, political, and economic nuances of the entire commodity chain. So now that we've grounded you in some of these theoretical uh, frameworks and concepts, we want to move this discussion into action for just and social food systems, because food justice is an action-based movement. This slide is artwork by Kelly Marcel Malka, and I'll put her contact in here. And I just really want to acknowledge her artwork and beautiful using her voice while still finding it. All right, now we're going to engage you again. If you, I'll put the link again for Padlet in here. And we want you to look at questions three and questions four. How is your socialization with food racialized? Sorry, I'm finding the link now. Um, in what ways did you engage with food growing up? Consider your relationship to food based on your history and socialization with it. In what ways might food have been racialized for your growing up, both in your diet and those of others? What have you perceived as normative food and how does that reflect on wider systems of power and privilege? And for the fourth question, what communities and whose ideas of how you think about food? Are your food, are your food ideologies universally applicable or might they privilege and conversely harm some? For whom and in what circumstances? Here's that Padlet link again. You guys can start ahead. Think about what groups and people may be left out of this conversation. In what circumstances and why? How might these perpetuate racism and other forms of oppression? Consider what underlying assumptions and values are embedded in your notion of sustainable food systems. What does sustainability mean for you? What does it mean for others and for whom and for how long? What might be some limitations of these assumptions? And here, let me share my screen again. Can you all see that? We're going to look at question three and four. Again, you can just click this little button down here, the plus, add a title. You write something. I 
and then you just post. And again, we're going to do this for about two minutes, looking at questions three and four. Uh, and we want to honor that, you know, we're coming towards the top of the hour. So there'll be a pause for people to segue out who need to, and we'll stay on for an additional 15 minutes after the hour. This is so great. Um, I'll read a couple for those on the call. Uh, let's see. How is your socialization with food racialized? And it's okay that you don't know. These are things, this is a space to think about these things, to learn about this, and it takes time to think about this. Choices that I make and choices that are offered are deeply connected to race, socioeconomics, geography. Yes. Foods that I'm more familiar with have always been accessible to me. To find what is high quality or good food and what is low quality and bad food. That Unaccustomed foods are strange, quote, exotic or starvation foods. Certain types of processed foods are for poor or uneducated quotes uneducated people. Certain types of processed foods are for affluent or educated people. The same could be said about certain raw foods. Certain types of cultural foods are more accessible for certain groups. For example, I think pickled duck tongue, fermented tofu, chicken nuggets, blood sausage, head cheese, processing American cheese is totally a normal. Question four, after working with small, medium-sized farms, my focus has primarily been on uplifting their work. However, I realize that the food they grow is not often accessible to low-income, marginalized communities, and I'm working to learn why that is and how we can change it. My parents have influenced me greatly. Growing food on my own has been a big influence. I once walked through Skid Row in Los Angeles in United States. No human being should be left on the curb apparently sitting without hope while society carries on with its ideas of what will fill its endless needs and soul. Beautiful. So how does this relate to food justice? The right of communities everywhere to produce, process, distribute, access, and eat good food regardless of race, class, gender, ability, religion, and community. This is how the Inter Institute of Agriculture and Trade Policy defines it. Using this framework, 
how might institutional racism and other forms of oppression prevent certain communities from accessing healthy food and culturally appropriate food, food that is, is, is appropriate for their, their cultural backgrounds. Food justice can be measured through a community's ability to access food as well as define its own food systems. So we want to dig deeper. We've sort of given you a cursory foundation of racial justice issues and why that relates to food systems. And we're going to go back into food, the Padlet and we want to know what you want to hear in this series and next. What is it that you want to know and how does this relate to your perspectives of food? I'll share my screen for the Padlet. Thanks, Kimberly. While you're sharing your screen, <clears throat> I just want to acknowledge that we are at the top of the hour. So thank you uh, to those. And we understand if you need to uh, step away. Uh, for some of you, this was your lunch hour and regular meetings start up again uh, at the top. But um, we would really like to hear uh, from you about um, what you'd like to see in uh, future episodes. So um, uh, Emily and Kimberly have graciously agreed uh, to uh, come back after we've also had some other voices. Um, and we would really like to make sure that we're addressing issues and concerns that, that, that you have and that you'd like to learn more about. So thank you for that. And, uh, and uh, while I have the, uh, the mic, I'll just mention that um, we do have all these webinars freely available online. I've shared in the chat the links, and I'll do that one more time before, um, before the end. So really appreciate your being here today. And I'm handing back uh, control of the mic to, uh, to you, Kimberly. I'm sure some of the folks who are on the phone really appreciate hearing, um, hearing you read a couple. Yes. OK, question five. How do you want to dig deeper into food justice? I want to learn, um, I can't see what this, um, a generation of, about generations of activists are saying and doing to help change the current unfair system, which I have seen develop over the decades. Yes, jargon does alienate people. That's a good point, thank you. I want to understand the history of food production, our current food systems, and food and folk ways of lots of different cultures. I want to share information and resources. I would like to learn about actionable steps. I can take work on food justice on a national scale and within own, my own community. Land sovereignty through land trusts and giving back land to BIPOC farmers. And the perceptions of shame around food how to incorporate justice work into climate action. I love that. Okay. Great, thank you. That's some yeah. really cool leads for us for thinking about what, what might come next. I, I did see, uh, Kimberly, I saw a question in the, uh, the chat asking, uh, uh, as to whether or not that Padlet will remain accessible to those who participated today. Uh, yeah, we can keep it open. You can use that link um, and add on to it. I think it's a really good sort of living resource for everyone. Great, thank you. I'm sure that would be I'm appreciated. Gonna, I'm gonna share um, our contact email right now. And with that, we can take questions. Yeah, wonderful. So I, I think you kept folks uh, busy <laughs> while, they were, <laughs> while they were typing, but I do see a hand up. So um, before I get, uh, Kathleen, I'm going to call on you in just a sec. Um, there was a, a question in the Q&A and that was about, um, um, you know, accessing the webinars. Um, and so I shared that in the chat, as I mentioned already. Um, oh, Kathleen's hand went down. So maybe that was a a goof, <laughs> but if anybody would like to ask a question, please feel free to uh, type it into the chat um, or you're welcome to, you do have a little button in your, um, on your Zoom that says raise your hand and so that'll send me a notification and I can just click on, click on your icon and you have the power of speech. 
um, Yeah. We're also really interested in what you all put in the fifth question panel, just FYI, because um, I think Kim alluded to this, but we really want to build a further panel or a further um, webinar that speaks to some of the things you'd like to dig into further. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm a professor. Professors are um, used to long, awkward silences trying to get <laughs> you know, students, students to feel comfortable uh, speaking or their questions. So, you know, we're happy to um, stay, stay here. I do see, um, oh, okay, it, there, there was a comment. This one's and a question more specific to uh, the Prescott College community asking about, um, you know, courses re related to um, uh, justice work and human right to food and so um, you're getting compliments Kimberly um, from students who uh, really appreciated your course and are interested in other courses that build upon that so so for the Prescott community um, you know I'm, I'm happy to uh, you know uh, send, send a list I'll get it out on your MSFS listserv but uh, perhaps off the top of your head Kimberly there's some other courses that you would suggest for folks Uh, what courses there are right now. Um, I'm not sure, but I'd be open to any mentored courses. Uh, there is a Molly Big Knife and Antonio and I do teach, have taught in um, Indigenous Peoples and the Knowledge and the Environment course in which we do touch a little bit on food, uh, a lot of land sovereignty and um, epistemology. And I know she teaches her own course in MAP that is focused on traditional ecological knowledge. Yeah, thank you. Now, there, there's a question here. Um, it's in the chat if you want to follow along. So it says, if you had the power to augment or transform U.S. domestic or foreign policy immediately, ooh, <laughs> what changes would you make? What kinds of social and financial repercussions would you worry about as a result of those changes? Richie, that was a big question. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know about you, Kim, but my work is so much more in educational systems, but possibly you could see um, parallels between systems, but certainly like when we think about tracking and how schools are stratifying, um, even around achievement, that's something that we look at uh, as something that's really, um, you look at the data around tracking and how that promotes and perpetuates segregation and the school to prison pathway and pipeline and so forth. So, I mean, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, at least in my opinion, it's really about working with leaders and policymakers around building consciousness around systems. Like every system is contextual, but needs to be looked at from a really um, consciously critical lens to understand and see the nuance of what in every sector is upholding these um, these systems of, of dominance and how can we bust it up. So I, I guess I feel like that would be an afternoon of co conversation and we have about five minutes, but I don't know, Kim, if you want to take that. It's a great question. <laughs> I think there needs, uh, needs to be changes in policy um, on how we treat lay, uh, farm workers um, and, that there need, and that there needs to be a little bit more transparency in a lot of these policies that are being, like where the funding is coming from and if there are other motives um, and where certain things are happening. And, and so I think that it's the systemic racism is laid in, in a lot of policies that are enforcing, you know, where farms are located, where they're, um, you know, in the next webinar, we'll learn about pesticide drift and how that impacts certain communities. 
Um, with regard to food access, I think it comes down to beyond policy. Um, I think having more access to say farmers markets, um, allowing EBT there, um, making it spaces that are welcoming to different, to BIPOC, BIPOC folks um, and, and where they're being located. I think that addressing a lot of the economic aspects is really important too. I don't know if I answered it. It's a, I think that could be a huge class. <laughs> It'd be a great class. Yeah. And we actually have, <laughs> yeah. Actually, Dr. Gimel Heron is uh, running her, uh, her food and agriculture policy course right now. And those are some of the issues they're grappling uh, with. Mm -hmm. um, I do have uh, some more questions that have popped up in the Q&A se section. And so I, I invite the panelists to uh, you know, look down on their uh, bar at the bottom of the Q&A to read along. So um, you know, one of the questions is uh, coming from, from Shelby. How, how can I be an ally to food justice organizers in my community without co-opting uh, their movements. So that's that's a whole topic. <laughs> and yeah, that's a great question. And we didn't really touch on that. Uh, we do in the food justice course in that it, I think it's about in being in any allyship and any community activism work in which the focus should be centering Black, Indigenous, people of color, and what they, their needs and wants. And so that non-co-opting and asking what they want and how, how you can be involved and how you can help. Um, and the key there is really listening with heart and, um, and um, listening with humility um, and understanding that these movements are have been going on with, within these communities, within BIPOC communities for a long time in that um, it is really important to be mindful to not go into these areas with this sort of savior mentality or, you know, what, and, and, th and with suggestions on what you think should happen, but really having that participatory action sort of mindset. And I, I had a student that um, that finished her PhD and she was working with um, BIPOC leaders in the farming movement, but she was a white student and a white person who'd been in their movement for many years. And so she did her work around working with white allies and accomplices and food justice spaces. Um, so I'm gonna look for that dissertation, but she trained a bunch of white food justice allies and how they can come and show up in spaces in ways that are responsible, accountable, equitable, um, and really um, not hijack the space, not hijack the leadership, but rather um, really listen with humility and curiosity through their participation in the movement. So I'm gonna look for that and see if I can pop it in the link as well. So there's another, um, another, question that again is related to um, land policy and how we use land as a society and and I think if with the permission of the panelists I'd actually like to to take this one because this is so <laughs> you know one of the things that we're learning in the policy landscape um, is that the the faster way to bring about a change is at the local level. And actually, if you start um, digging in to um, the sphere of responsibility and level of authority related to your local planning commissions, um, that is where a lot of uh, food systems activists are finding leverage points to bring about change. And so a lot of uh, the land uh, policies are actually a little more grassroots. They're developed at the level of your local policy commissions. And so that's an important starting point um, for bringing about slightly more rapid change than some of the other policy structures. But of course, engaging with your um, local food policy council, if you have one, um, and then also, you know, just uh, uh, voting, <laughs> you know, uh, paying attention to the conversations that are happening. But but a lot of um, the, anyway, 
that's that's there because I want to make sure I address the final um, question that uh, was put, and it was a question about um, how is Prescott College um, investing in BIPOC peoples to ensure that these voices are at the table? Are there scholarships for Indigenous students? So, actually, so Prescott College has um, um, a very in depth. I just had a meeting with our uh, financial aid <laughs> director uh, two days ago speaking about um, uh, our students and um, a very detailed and very thorough way of um, helping to ensure that students are accessing all kinds of uh, financial aid opportunities, which include scholarships. So I would encourage anybody who's interested um, in, in that to be in touch directly with our financial aid office. Um, we do also have uh, specific designated um, scholarships, but um, our institution, like all institutions of higher education, are really asking for uh, the population to do more. Um, and so if people are wondering how to support, um, how to support <laughs> humans, the human right to food, and uh, BIPOC and Indigenous students, then um, the, the gift of um, an education is there and so all institutions are looking for scholarship supports and then there are also designated uh, scholarship opportunities um, coming from a lot of the um, organizations that uh, support uh, BIPOC communities so yeah it's we have options available but it's never enough and so perhaps that's where we we end things today with that. You know, we still have we still have uh, work to do. It's not enough. Um, but uh, I want to thank you, Emily and uh, Kimberly, for your time today. And uh, I appreciate the participation um, of everyone and and all of you who have stayed with us um, here until uh, you know 15 after the hour. So thank you. And our next uh, webinar, I did see uh, that as a question. Um, we're on a two week uh, rotation. So our next webinar will be on August 7th at this exact same time. So looking forward to having you uh, join, join then. So thank you so much. Thank you all so much. What a treat. Thank really you cool. everyone. And feel free to email if you have other questions, like we could talk about reparations, we could talk about other things um, on, in other channels or possibly at a future webinar. So thank you for your ongoing curiosity. Yeah, and as folks are, are clicking off, I just wanna, I don't know, you know, when you're a, a, a panelist and leading the discussion and <laughs> yeah, trying to manage all the screens, sometimes you don't have time to keep track of all the chat, but I hope, Em and Kimberly that you'll take a look um, at the chat um, for words of appreciation coming from from many of the participants. So I, I really appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you.